Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and in this brief video, I will address a specific question that one of the subscribers had raised within my series on Orientalism. And uh, she had cited this one passage from page one of the introduction and asked my opinion about it. So I'll put the passage on screen and first read it. And here is the passage. The Orient is not only adjacent to Europe, it is also the place of Europe's greatest and richest and oldest colonies, the source of its civilizations and languages, its cultural constant, and one of its deepest and most recurring images of the other. In addition, the Orient has helped to define Europe, or the West, as its contrasting image, idea, personality, experience. So that's the passage that uh, was quoted to me and uh, one of the subscribers asked me to explain it. So here we go. Okay, so before I delve into the passage, there is one distinction that we must make and that is the other in this paragraph. Now remember, the other in this paragraph, the O, is uppercase. It's capitalized. And that teaches us something, that tells us something. Whenever the O in the other is capitalized, chances are that it is referring to what Lacan calls the big other. Okay, so the Lacan's, in Lacanian psychoanalysis, there is the small other or little other and the big other. Right? And the big other designates radical alterity, an otherness which transcends the illusionary otherness of the imaginary because it cannot be assimilated through identification. Though the small other is when the child sees his or herself in the mirror as this other, and that can be assimilated into the self. The big other is the larger symbolic order, anything other than yourself within which you function. And it is that radical alterity. So please watch my lecture on alterity as well. But that distinction is crucial to be made in this paragraph. OK, so let's read the passage again. The Orient is not only adjacent to Europe. It is also the place of Europe's greatest and richest and oldest colonies, the source of its civilizations and languages, its culture, cultural contestant, and one of its deepest and most recurring images of the other. In addition, the Orient has helped to define Europe, or the West, as its contrasting image, idea, personality, experience. So first of all, I mean, the reason he's putting this right in the introduction is by way of suggesting that I'm not plucking Orient from some obscure corner of European imagination and making it into a research topic for a book. What he's trying to argue is that the Orient is geographically connected to Europe. Europe has its colonies there. It's also the place of most of the medieval and other conflicts and contestations between Europe and its Oriental other. It serves that function. Right, And it serves as this other against which Europe can stabilize its own identity. Now, in order to really get that, we have to understand Saussurean linguistics and within that sign being differential and not substantial. I'll come to it in a minute. And of course, since we already know that Said is using Foucault's theory of discourse to write this book, we have to know Foucault. We already mentioned Lacan. I mean, this also teaches us how a deep reading of a deeply theoretical work ought to be conducted. So let's go to the linguistic part. Now, I'm not going to delve deeper into it. I have a lecture on it, which you can watch, right? But basically, the sign, since it means only because of its differences from other signs in so sure, then sign, a sign system or a sign doesn't have substantial meaning. It has differential meanings. What that implies 
is that a sign means something because of what is it is not that means the meaning is located in its other right that's a crucial distinction to make so Europe, in order to know itself as Europe needs this other, because it cannot mean anything by itself, it won't know itself, so the Orient becomes that other, right? So whatever ever Europeans think they are not, it's juxtaposed onto Orient and then through discourse perpetuated, right? So the Orient is this absolute necessity. Now, if we come to it through Foucault's theory of discourse, especially later Foucault, when he's talking about governmentality, the idea is that every branch of knowledge, a discursive framework, has its enunciating subjects, the researchers, the scholars, the philosophers, who constantly must produce knowledge within their area of specialization. And what that does is a perpetuation of objects of study. So in a circular move, then, in a discursive framework, then the objects of study are absolutely necessary for the existence of the researcher, for the existence of the scientists, right? So similarly, in this situation, for West to stabilize itself, to claim an identity, it must then perpetually create this other, right? upon which all its ills can be impugned, which becomes a cross contrasting image, a contrasting history, a contrasting system of government. If you watch my lecture on chapter one, you already know from Balfour's speech that this idea that the Orient was never self-governing, that it was autocratic, naturally so, was inherently a part of the Orientalist discourse. So overall, you know, briefly, this passage then in the very beginning of the introduction teaches us that the Orient is this non-assimilable other within the symbolic order for Europe. But it is not far removed. It is geographically adjacent to Europe. It has had a history of contacts and contestations in, with Europe. And it currently holds Europe's richest colonies. So it is something that is in a way, part of Europe already, but as this extreme other, right? And then it is that other that is absolutely necessary for Europe to define and stabilize its own self-presentation, its own identity, because without that, how would Europeans know who they are, right? How does anyone know who they are without this other, without this alterity? So that's what this paragraph, in my opinion, is talking about. I hope that answers your question, and it helps amplify the lectures on introduction. Please watch this within the context of this series on Orientalism. And as always, thank you so much for joining me here. And I please do promote these lectures and the channel to your friends and colleagues. I would love for more people to come and join us, and in the process, help me spread this knowledge and these messages to a wider audience, and I'll really appreciate it. Thank you so much, and as always, peace and love.